Do you know that the definition of fear is taking belief that something is a threat towards you? So you're taking belief in something you can't see every day. Wow. But what you're doing right now is choosing to one, believe in something you can't see, but you're choosing fear. And in return, you're getting insecure and you're having to struggle with something wow. that was actually always intended to be your strength, but now the enemy's put on that your weakness. But if you would just choose faith, your whole story changes. If you just choose to believe in God, the same thing that you cannot see, wow. then you're all of a sudden and confident in something that the enemy put on you as your weakness, but it's actually your weapon of strength. And it was just this moment that he was just like. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what the giant is. God doesn't want you to lose heart. And this is the plan of the enemy, right, Sadie? The first thing he wants to do is steal our hope. And he tells us, you'll never change. Yeah. It's never going to be different. Yeah. It's always going to be this way. Did you ever bump up against that in your struggle as well? Oh, absolutely. And I think that sometimes it's like you get discouraged when it doesn't change. And that's another thing that the enemy will use is like that discouragement of like it happened again or like, oh, yeah. you're still facing it. And then you get to that point of feeling like defeated and you lose that hope. And yeah. that's essential. I think um, for me, I remember one time I was so upset because I thought I had like, I was free of fear and I like, it happened again. Like I got so afraid and like I started getting so anxious about something. And I remember I immediately started praying, but I was praying this prayer that like God would fix the situation around me. And I remember like very clearly just God really speaking to my heart in this moment of like, kind of notice how you're praying because the minute you yeah, stop yeah. praying for your circumstances to change and you just start praying for your heart to change, wow. that's when everything's wow. going to start happening for you. Because when you pray for your circumstances to change, you get discouraged when they're not changing. But when you stop and you pray for your heart to change, understanding that that's the real change, like he will defeat yeah. the giant, it, he must fall. In those moments, you realize that even though you're in the same circumstance, the same situation you've always been in, that's when you have peace that surprises all understanding and that's when you have this confidence that doesn't even make sense because that's when God comes and fights on your behalf yes. and, that yes. is yeah. and that's the message yeah. that is our message and that's the message that we're trying to actually get across tonight is that God is fighting yes, for you that's so, good. so right after David says don't let anyone lose heart he says you know this is going to go down this guy's going down yeah. today and they looked at David and they said how are you going to do that look at you you're 14 years old <laughs> And he says, when I was keeping my dad's sheep yeah. and a lion came, I turned, I <laughs> struck that lion, I rescued that sheep from its mouth, I killed yeah. that lion and I've killed a bear. And you would think he's saying, so that's my resume mm -hmm. and that's why I'm gonna kill this giant. But the next line is the, lion, the line that I love. He says, and the same God mm -hmm. who gave me the power yeah. <laughs> to kill the lion and the bear is yeah. gonna take down this Philistine Ooh, giant good. today. So yeah. he was saying, it's not David that's gonna take him down, yeah. it's that same power of God. And that's true for you today. Yes. God is fighting for you. And he's not looking for you to, you know, to, to hulk up and become a superhero. He's mm -hmm. looking for you to wake up today and look yeah. up and realize there's a giant slayer in your story today. Mm -hmm. And he is bigger than whatever you are facing. And Sadie and I are not minimizing the giants. I love that. We're not minimizing the danger of a giant. And for me, it was anxiety. And I tell people all the time, Sadie, that was eight years ago when I was in a pit for months out of commission. And here I am by the grace of God, and yeah. here you are by the grace of God. Look, here's two people by the grace of God who are saying today, Jesus is bigger than whatever you are facing in yeah. your life. He is bigger than the giant. But people say, well, what's it like for you now? And then I have to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I say, anxiety is still in my story. Yeah. It's not right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're sitting in Atlanta, Georgia right now. It's probably like on the outskirts of the city somewhere over there, but I know what it is, yeah. and I know how to fight it. Mm. And when it starts coming my way, I know it's not gonna kill me, and I know it's not gonna take me out, because I know yes. Jesus has already defeated it, and so I can good. walk in what Jesus so has already done for me. So you're 20, I've said that three times already, but I think it's amazing that God has raised you up, Sadie, and you have a lot of, a lot of confidence and a lot of wisdom and I love the way you boldly speak about Jesus everywhere you go. And if someone's watching right now that is 20 and they're in that place, maybe not even able to go to work, mm -hmm. uh, not able to go to school, 
not functioning in life, or maybe you're older than 20, but you're in that same space. What, what would you say, or how could you just encourage somebody watching right now that God is going to make a way for them? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, it's funny um, that you said that. I think one of the biggest things that I would say to any 20-year-old or any really anybody is that you got to believe he's fighting for you. You got to believe he is for you. And in your weakness, he will be your strength. And it's actually kind of funny that you said the two words, you said confidence and wisdom. Because honestly, like in high school, I was like not very smart. Like school smart, not my thing, okay? Just being completely honest. Confidence was not my thing either. I was very insecure, very shy. My teachers like asked my mom if I even talked. That's not a joke. So like major, this was my weakness, but because of the grace of yeah. God, because God is so good. He is so strong in your weakest years and that's what you have to embrace because when you embrace that and just let him be him, it's so fun to get to walk around and like say things that you're like, how in the world, if it was not God, how could I possibly Absolutely. do that? Because it's so out of my nature, but it's just who he is. And when he's fighting for you, there's just no limits to what you can do. But I would encourage you by this because I actually was talking to an, a 20 year old um, recently and this moment was kind of a David and Goliath moment for him. Um, we were talking and it was so random. My friend had set this little conversation up because she said, you got to talk to my friend. He's been a Christian all his life and he just recently just said that he's an atheist. He doesn't believe anymore. He's done with it. Wow. And she said, can you talk to him? And I was like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so I go and I sit with this guy, he's the same age as me. And I just kind of start talking to him, just really asking his story. What's, what's his life about? And, um, I noticed that he had a little bit of a different accent, but he was like the smartest guy I've ever met in my life. I'm not kidding. Like using big words and back to the whole high school thing. I was like, Whoa. So it was like really cool. Okay. So I was like, God, you're really going to have to do work in this. So I'm talking to him and he's so smart and all this stuff. And Eventually, I just said, okay, so why not God? And he goes, well, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm mad. He said, I'm mad at God. He said, because, you know, my whole life, I grew up and I was deaf. I couldn't hear at all. And I would just pray for this miracle to happen. I just thought if I could just hear, it would all be fine. He said, then I got my miracle and I had this surgery and I can hear now. But as soon as I began to speak, I noticed that I'm talking different than everybody else. And every single day because of that, I have to live with the insecurity of that, of what others think of me. I have to live in the fear of what others think of me. And I just can't do it anymore. And he said, I don't even want to do it anymore. And I'm just, I'm just done. And then I said, wow, you know, I, I did not see that coming. I didn't know that about your story. And I said, um, is that it? Is that the reason why? Because if you're just mad at God, do you really not believe in him? And he said, I mean, honestly, too, I just couldn't believe in a God that I can't see. How could I take belief in something I can't see? And why would I if I was going to be mad at him anyways? I said, okay. And I sat there, and immediately it just hit me. Because this whole time I've been sitting here talking to this guy, and I'm thinking, like, he's so smart. His words are clearly his strength, his way that he talks. And I said, isn't it interesting that I'm sitting here this whole time hearing how smart you are and thinking your words are your strength, and you, you say that your speech is your weakness. Wow. Interesting fact. Then we kind of start talking about that. And then I say, and didn't you say that you're afraid every day of your life? He said, yeah. I said, do you know that the definition of fear is taking belief that something is a threat towards you? So you're taking belief in something you can't see every day. Wow. But what you're doing right now is choosing to, one, believe in something you can't see, but you're choosing fear. And in return, you're getting insecure, and you're having to struggle with something wow. that was actually always intended to be your strength, but now the enemy's put on that your weakness. But if you would just choose faith, your whole story changes. If you just choose to believe in God, the same thing that you cannot see, wow. then you're all of a sudden confident in something that the enemy put on you as your weakness, but it's actually your weapon of strength. And it was just this moment that he was just like, <laughs> and I was wow. actually kind of like, wow. And we sat there and I was like, isn't that something that the enemy will put something in your face and define to as your weakness all your life? And you'll believe it and you'll sit in it and you'll be afraid. But the minute you just say, no, not my God, he is so much bigger and yeah. he will be my strength and my weakness. All of a sudden you get up and the very thing that's been holding you back all your life is now the very thing that you talk about, that you're confident about. Look at Live Fearless. That's the thing that held me in a pit for three years. Now it's the very thing 
thing I talk about to people all over the world. That is who our God is, and that's what he wants to do in your life. All you got to do is choose to believe in faith over believing in fear. Oh, and it just so great. We've talked about graphic overt crushings, but I want to warn the audience about invisible crushings that come from forces that you cannot see, like stress and heartbreak and pain. Nobody has to be sick or lock you up or you don't have to come out of prison for you to be crushed by stress. Uh, science teaches us that the same part of our body that reacts to physical pain, <clears throat> the same signal goes to your brain from emotional pain. It sends out the same stimuli throughout the neurological system mm. when your heart is broken mm. as if it would if your leg was broken. Really? So you don't necessarily have to incur physical injury mm. to be crushed by emotional stress. Mm. And we are living in a time of, of unseen forces bearing down on our soul on a daily basis. Everything is going so fast. Technology, social media, we've got everybody saying everything about everything all of the time. And the whirlwind that we're in right now is the wine press. Mm. The whirlwind, the, the spinning, the mad spinning of our lives causes the, the, the centrifugal force of being spun around causes pressure all by itself. And, and in that fast pace that we live in, there is a certain amount of invisible pressure. And the strange thing about it is you feel the pain, you sense the pressure, and you can't see the source. Mm. So all of a sudden, you're getting the impact as if there were an assailant. Hmm. But there's no assailant that you can't, can see. You can't lash out. And, and God says you can, you can either see it as the wine press or you can see it as the potter's wheel. Hmm. But the more it spins, the more he touches it and the more it changes in the spinning. And if you are not prepared for disruption, then you're not prepared for resurrection. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Not prepared for disruption. Yeah. You're not prepared for resurrection. Yeah. What I hear you saying to us is, is don't try to escape your troubles. No. But lean into them. Lean into it. Lean into them. Lean into and, it. And, and, and say, God, what are you telling me? What are you teaching me? Consider it all joy, my brethren. Yes, sir. When you face various trials and tribulations. Yes. Yeah. And, and I'll be honest. That's not, the, the, somebody said, that's not easy to do. No. Uh, it, it's not something that you do from the place of your emotions. It's something that you do from the place of your teaching. I went through a period in my life that I was just being crushed. My heart was broken. I was worried. It was one of the most distraught moments in my life. And I was literally crying when I told God this. I said, Lord, I hate this. I absolutely hate this. But I love you. And I know you would not allow me to go through this if it were not for my good. And though tears are running down my face and I cannot see my way out, if, if you suffered me to be bruised, it is only to make me better. Mm. And so I trust you when I mm. can't trace you. Yeah. yeah. Because he that hath began a good work in me. Will bring it to completion. Shall bring it to completion. You yeah. cannot you convince me. It. Yeah. yeah. You cannot convince me that he's not for me. Mm. Mm. And if whatever he ordered for me to face, it, when it's all over, it has got to end for me. Mm. Because I am, con the, the, the relationship that I am the most secure of mm. is him. And the reason I am so secure is there's nothing about me that he has not considered. Mm. From start to finish. From start to finish. There's not, all things are naked before him with mm -hmm. whom we have to do. Yeah. 
you know, my, I could disappoint my wife or disappoint my children or disappoint my mother. They could find out something about me and change their mind about me. God could never find out anything about me. Not cannot be surprised. Yeah, he cannot be surprised. <laughs> there, there's nothing yeah. about me that he doesn't already know. He's already made up his mm. mind about me. He has rendered his verdict. He has rendered his verdict, yeah. and there is therefore now yeah. no condemnation. No condemnation. Yeah. So yeah. whatever he ordered for me to go through in process, right? right. Well, you, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and mm. you should fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy mm. rod and thy staff, thou, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I anointed my head mm. with oil, my cup. My cup runneth over. You can't have the run over if you don't go through the valley of the shadow yeah, of death. Yeah. And, and, and listen at hope screaming in his ears <laughs> in the darkest moments of his life. Surely, not surely, maybe, not surely, hopefully, but surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow, shall follow me. me all the days of my life. And when it's all over, I'm going to dwell in the house yes, of the Lord, Lord forever. forever. I love that. That's good. <laughs> I love That's that. good. That's good. Yeah. So when, when we stand, you and I, over short caskets and small graves and children burned in fires, it isn't always possible to explain no, sir. suffering. Yeah. Uh, it isn't always possible to, to make people uh, rejoice in that type of agony. Hmm. Uh, I teach people, just survive it. Hmm. That's what we have to do. Just it? survive it. Don't yeah. try to understand it. Right, right. Just survive it. Yeah. Because if, if you survive it, on the other side of it, you're going to see something hmm. that makes it, in retrospect, make more sense than it does yeah. today. It does, doesn't yeah. it? it does. Yeah, yeah. Looking back at the rearview mirror, uh, you, it's not that it was ever a wonderful thing to go through, but had my father not died when he did, I wouldn't be who I am. His death was, was the birth of my ministry. Mm, mm. You see, and, and this, the seeds always hint to us that life comes out of death. Mm. As the outer encasement corrodes in the ground, mm. the inner life bursts forth. Yeah. And everything that dies in you is only so that something else can be born in you. Yeah, yeah. God counts the number of stars. He counts the number of the stars and he calls them by name. And Im immediately the psalmist says, before that, he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Look at the contrast. Right after that, he counts the number of the stars. He calls them all by name. And yet, he comes right after he says, he heals the broken heart and binds up their wounds. The God who amongst us can count the the number of the stars. Who among us can fathom the sorrow of a broken heart? The same God who can count the number of the stars and call them by names is the God who binds up the broken hearted on earth. <laughs> what a savior. In the greatness of his love, he gave us his only begotten son. He sent him to this earth to heal broken hearts. One of the primary things that Jesus said He came to do, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor and to heal the brokenhearted. You know, the world is full of broken hearts. There might be outward gaiety and laughter, but like Solomon says in the book of Proverbs, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. So they try to cover up with laughter. You know, you switch on the TV, you hear them laughing all the time. But no one knows the secret sorrows and broken hearts out there in the world. But Jesus does. And he binds up the broken hearts. Do you know how he binds up our broken hearts? Remember that weeping sinner woman who came in Luke 7 and, and wept at his feet? And Jesus was at the house of a Pharisee. And he looked at the Pharisee, and the Pharisee was thinking in his mind, well, if Jesus knew, if he's a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. Obviously, she was a woman of ill repute in that town. How she found his house, I do not know. 
She probably knew his address before this. Anyway, she heard that Jesus was in his house, in the Pharisee's house, and she made her way there. And the Bible says she wept over his feet because in those days they would recline, their feet would be behind, and she would come behind, and Jesus is looking at the Pharisee, and the Pharisee is looking at her. And she would weep at his feet and wipe his feet with her hair. And then Jesus looked at the Pharisee, and Jesus knew what he was thinking. If he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this is. And Jesus says, Simon, there was the name of the Pharisee, I have something to tell you. There were two debtors. One owed $100,000, and the other owed $100. When they both could not pay the creditor, he forgave them both. Which of the two debtors do you think will love him more? He's speaking the Pharisee's language because he had dollar signs in his eyes. And then he said, well, I suppose the one he forgave the most. I came to your house. You gave me no customary greeting. You don't give me the water to wash my feet. But since she came in, she has not ceased to weep on my feet and to wipe my feet with her hair. You know why she does that, Simon? Because whoever is forgiven much will love much. And that's why our message is to tell the world, you are forgiven. It needs to be received, yes, but you need to tell them they are forgiven. Amen. We are all forgiven of our sins. It is because we, we think we are forgiven as we go. We are forgiven as we repent. Now, today, in the Old Testament, if I live in the Old Testament, you have to repent first before God can bless you, before God can forgive you. But under grace, God forgives you already. And if you receive that forgiveness, that forgiveness will lead you to change your mind about whatever areas there is in your life. This is the gospel. And why are we so afraid to tell people that their sins are are forgiven past, present, and future. They are. Because we think that we preach a message that tells people their sins are forgiven. By the way, that bad thought you had of me just now is forgiven. (laughs) That worst thought that you had just now of Matt (laughs) is forgiven. What a relief when you you live your life no longer introspective and self-occupied, but Christ-occupied. What a life! You will fail in your thought, word, and deed. I'm not prophesying, and some people don't like to hear that. But listen, this is not sinless perfection. You are righteous in God's eyes, but you are not your own righteousness. It's a gift. God sees you righteous, but in and of yourself, you will still fail. And you need to know you are forgiven. When a bad thought comes, just say, thank you, Lord. I'm forgiven. When you worship and a bad thought comes, you don't have to put on your hands, sit down, and start confessing, 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 confessing. You just say, thank you, Lord, I'm forgiven, and go on worshiping the Lord. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, We couldn't do it. God bless you.